Thank you. So how much of it do you want to play? What do you want to do? Do you want to work movement by movement a little bit and see how far we can get with the time? Okay. Okay. So we're going to probably work, uh, probably talk a little bit after each movement and see how much time permits. Uh, no, I don't need the score, but I do have a charming story to tell you about the sonata. Samuel Barber was very young when he wrote this. He was a student at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, and um, about 15 years ago, a very, very wonderful teacher, a very sweet man named Orlando Cole, who taught cello at Curtis until practically he was 100 years old, um, came to visit New England Conservatory, and he gave a master class. And he was a man of, a very, very sweet man, but a man of very few words. And it was arranged that three people should play for him in about the time format that we have today. And he, um, the first young man who's now in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra came and played the first movement of the Elgar Concerto, and he said, well, you know, sometimes the vibrato should be a little bit wider. Could you play the next movement, please? You know, oh, do you have anything else? I mean, it was in 12 minutes the first person was finished. And I saw an impending, not disaster, but challenge, how I should say. And I was the, I was the host for the class. So I got up and I said, uh, Mr. Cole, you know, I know you were involved in the, in the early days with this sonata. Can you tell us something about it? He said, well, yes, he said. He said, first of all, I can tell you that, um, that uh, Sam was a triple major at the Curtis Institute, composition, piano, and voice. Okay. And his, uh, his aunt, maybe some of you who are opera buffs will know her name. She was a very great star at the Metropolitan Opera 100 years ago. Her name was Louise Homer. That was, that was his aunt. Okay. And so opera and voice was very much part of his life from the very beginning. Anyway, so he wrote a wonderful piece for string quartet and singer called Dover Beach. And there is a recording of the Curtis String Quartet in which Orlando Cole is playing. And Sam Barber is the singer. So and that's a historical item. And you can find that. I don't know whether you can find it on YouTube as a, just a recording, but it can be found. I have it at home. And, um, he was a good singer. In any case, so Mr. Cole was telling us all, says, so, so Sam was writing this cello sonata, and I was there, and uh, Orlando Cole was there from the very first day of the Curtis Institute in 1926 or something like that, when it opened its doors. And he said it was, this was in the 30s, and he said in 33, 34, I can't remember what, does it say when it was written? 32. Okay, so uh, he said, so Sam would bring me a page of it and I would try it out in my suggestions. And then Cole said something that showed that we were living in kind of a time warp. He said, so he said, not to do with CDs and iPads and all that kind of stuff. He said, so you know, in those days there was no scotch tape. something that, you know, has been around all of our lives. No scotch tape. So when Sam made a correction, he would write it on a piece of paper and I would attach it to my music with a straight pin. <laughs> wow. Let's hear the first movement of <laughs> Sam Barber's Sonata. <laughs>
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit and we'll hold the deserved applause till the end. Um, you both are playing really, really well. Um, a few things that really not too much to say because you both have the spirit of the character of the piece so well in hand and it's a pleasure to hear it. Uh, Mariko-san, can you be a little bit careful in the forte sections with this big piano to listen harder to her sonority? So, can't hear me? Okay, I was talking. Okay, so what I was saying, <laughs> uh, what I was saying um, <laughs> was that they're playing really, really well and there are just a few things that need adjusting. One, I was suggesting to the pianist that when the music is very loud to be a little bit more careful about the balance, okay? But they have the character of it all very well. Can I bring the music stand over here? So, um, this piece, which has two thematic ideas, one is based on the interval of the sixth, is always best outlined. <laughs> I think mostly you're doing it, but even though it's not, it's also not. So, actually, I'd like you to do something that's going to make you feel it better without the piano. Can you first of all go and then? So, you're obviously not going to do that. But can you do something so that you fill the space of the interval mm -hmm. with your bow? Again, this is the bow that can do things the piano can't do. So that you have <laughs> So you feel the space filled, mm -hmm. slowly without the piano first. Sure, you are doing it. Eh? So I'd like the two of you to play. Just play as you played at the beginning. Don't change any bowings or anything, but fill the shape a little bit better. It's great. And what happens here is at the top, while you're holding that high A flat, is you're suffering. How am I going to keep playing loud? And she's taking her time because it says molto espressivo. And she's your friend. She's not trying to do you in. Or, uh, she is a little bit actually succeeded in, in doing you in, but she doesn't mean it. But so what can you do so that we don't worry about your survival. <laughs> what can you do? Mm, slow down. Slow Why don't you not only slow down, but <laughs> save, drop after the beginning of it, go away and grow to the very end of it so that we have no sense that you've lost. Okay, tempo, beginning. I was telling somebody er earlier today, I was recently, uh, I'm on sabbatical this year, my wife is Japanese and we spent time in Asia. And we were in Japan for a while and I went to some place I'd never been before in Kyushu, I'd never been in the southern island. And there is a city in the south called Kagoshima. 
and there's a very famous volcano that you see. Have you been there? Okay, it's called Sakurajima, which is, means Cherry Island. Okay, and the very day that we were there, which is common, there were five eruptions of the volcano, just big puffs of gray smoke. We went to visit the island, and when we came home, we were covered with ash, you know. But what I would like to think about is that there is something volcanic about this piece. And so when after she plays the ah da 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 da, you're so comfortable and you go ah da 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 da. Um, the volcano doesn't look at its watch and say it's time now to blow smoke. I want you to give us the impression that something is on the verge of being out of control. Beginning together. Two, three. So, just a second. I have to ask you, Mariko, where we just stopped. Is there anything you can do to clear your sound whenever she goes in the middle register, like with the pedal? Can you hold you? Dumpada. So can these all be uh, not? But. Uh, First note. Okay, together now that phrase. Two, three, four, one. Okay, so the fact of the matter is the lower she gets on the cello, the harder it is for her to make her sound go out. And she's doing everything she can do. So when you get around here, you as your line goes down, you have to be a cellist. You have to be in the, in the community of cellists and be part of the group, you know? So, okay, once more. Two, three, four, one. One. Go! 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 Fine. So it doesn't say to do that, <laughs> but I sure as hell do. Okay, <laughs> when I play it. Okay, it, it's supposed to be on the verge of being out of control. And you know, I was behaving like a buffoon up here, stamping around. But you get the picture: is that this is something that's swirling around and it can't be stopped. Now, when you come right where I stopped you. You've got to be extremely careful about the rests. You've got to be absolutely silent so when she plays the C up there, there's no other sound happening. And when she plays the lower C, ba da da, pa da, ba da da, pa da. Okay, so write uh, the 3 2 bar, bar before 16. It's bar 15, actually. Okay, 2, 3, here we go. Okay, it's already better. Now, Jackie, you can do something too. What you can do with your bow is move it faster at the beginning of the show. We don't care about what happens after the note. She's going to be making sound that so we can't quite hear you anyway. Mm -hmm. But we have to hear the beginning of the note. Mm -hmm. So move, just play alone once. Okay, and I don't think I don't think that can you be like you're hitting two gong, four gongs in a row? Okay, now right on that bar, two, three, four. Okay, so look, we all have heard the string players play. Down bow and up bow. 
we all as humans breathe in, we breathe out. Okay, it's two things. Now, the fact is that to be a really good string player, you have to be able to play a downbow that sounds like an upbow and an upbow that sounds like a downbow. So just as an exercise, let's start. You're playing down, up, down, up. Let's play up, down, up, down and see what happens, okay? Okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Okay, now play what's written. You learned what you need to do, okay? Okay, my suggestion about a way to make the ending bigger is play before 23, one, two, three bars, where the half notes are. I'm going to play, okay? What did I do? Um, you did the third chord that you stopped. Um, I waited a little bit, right? Okay. So the thing is that we cellists, God love us, we play an instrument that can't make a lot of sound. We can be killed by the piano. Can you imagine playing the Dvorak Concerto in front of an orchestra with 90 people, 12 of whom are cellists who are wishing they were sitting where you are? <laughs> okay. So it's a real issue. How do we present ourselves and succeed? So one of the things that is the music we play is sound in time. And the impression of size is very often a question of timing as much as it is of volume. Um, if you can dom, pom, pa, something like that that shows us that you are big, really big by the spacing. Okay, right there, the two of you. Just a second. It's not. It's in. Don't put a dot on that note. Right on. Pick up to twenty-three. Okay. Fine. 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 Okay. So I don't have enough time. You're just really both doing awfully, awfully well. And so it's fun for me to pick at you because I'm picking at a very high level. It's really good. Um, tiny thing at the very end of the movement. You have piano, crescendo, decrescendo, and it doesn't quite say what you did by a <laughs> I liked the way you played that in a very cadenza-like fashion, free. When you come to the end, though, it's a <laughs> it's the opposite of before. It's the, the 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 note that outlines the interval is the note you're coming from. Uh, and I would do. Can you uh, can you play with me before the end with the piano is written? You could do a tiny bit of that. So can we start the cadenza, pick up to 444? See, I would I would not keep getting slower and slower at the end. I think of the, it's uh, four, two, four. 
bow is not tuned to the piano. Try once more from yeah. <laughs> Second movement.
was that was really beautiful. That was really beautiful from both of you. The whole middle section was as together as I've ever heard it. I don't know how you figured out. There's a place where you've got uh, nine against eight or nine against twelve or so, something like that, and it's you got it just right. So bravo to you for that. Um, you started and you played it in a very interior way and was very communicative, and I really liked it. You could have gotten a little bit bigger for the one crescendo in there, mm -hmm. but where I really needed a lot more was this, the opening section, it's a three-part section, it's this adagio, beautiful melody, like an aria from a Barber opera, and it ends with the same melody again, and in the middle is this this light stuff, you know, which was good. You could do more cello rondo, by the way, but I'll let you fuss with that. <laughs> um, I need more substance in your sound mm -hmm. in this. It's not that you are not intending to. You are feeling it really well, and I think you're communicating that feeling. You're a good communicator. But I would like more body in the sound. So. Let's work together from the 48. And can I tune with the piano now, finally? Can I hear the low C? Okay, so can we do from right on di nuovo adagio? Right there. Okay. My first question is where does where's the top of the line? Sure. You make it on the D, mm -hmm. and then you fall. Okay. Can you keep the line, whether by motion or whether by, I don't know what. Just make it go all the way to the C. Okay. Once more. So that's the first new high level. So after gauge your crescendo so it's not but do you notice that I'm making a crescendo with both hands? Mm -hmm. Right? That means I'm doing something with the vibrato also to intensify the note. So can we do from the second phrase, mezzo piano? <laughs> Start it soft. No, no vibrato. See the. Strokes. Okay, check. It's a little bit like I showed you in the. You have to move your bow quicker at the beginning of the stroke. 
It's a kind of a curious thing. You could measure the volume of the sound by, if you were a scientist, you could measure the decibel against time, and you could end up with something that looked like a rectangle, because it was this loud that long. And you could, you know, we all remember the, the area of a rectangle is A times B, okay, something like that. And you could contrast that with something where the note started very much louder and tailed off in the same amount of time. And probably if it was a certain amount, the actual volume of that sound would be added up to be less. But the impression on the listener would be that it was a louder note because of the way it began. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about a little bit. If you can, after... <laughs> Not it's a little bit like out of a toothpaste tube, a little bit gooey. So um, can you start um, the F that you reached, the forte, pick up the... You know, if you will hold the end of the last note, when you have a long slide, mm -hmm. the note you're coming from has to be very established in order to make it, if you go, it sounds top heavy. It doesn't sound like it's supported. If you, if you can hold it, is he ever going to play that note? Oh, wow. You see, that's the idea. Da 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 da. Just the bar before that, the E flat. <laughs> now breathe. No, boy. If I was singing, I would need to just da. <laughs> and you should do it with your bow. On the F, the bar, the bar said 56. Okay. Take your bow off. Outline the notes. That's the, that's the last loud note of the piece. Go for it. Two, three, four, one, two. Less and less. Okay, maybe uh, a little crying in it. Don't play the last note too soon. Slide. Wait. And you need a more begin, just a... The only way you're going to be able to keep that long note loud enough is exactly what the pianist would have to do. She would know that the note is always going to decay. So she has to start it louder than the dynamic that's written. So the general impression is that it's still there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can we do from ya da 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 da?
Well, as they say, on that note, we're done. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>